Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Sulphur Springs Baptist Church. I guess I can take this off up here. Brother Joel's not here. I know I don't look quite as pretty. My hair's not per perfect and all that kind of stuff uh, as he is. But then again, uh, I think he's out getting to do. Jimmy, uh, Jimmy's wife called me this morning. She goes, I'm sick. You cannot hear me, Brother Guy. Okay, I think the volume's a little low because Brother Guy can't hear me. That or he's just losing his hearing. So, uh, Oh, y'all look back at Brother Guy. Two for two. In other words, second Sunday, he's supposed to have two. He's already had the game. He's got two wonderful guests here. Thank you for coming. I hope you have a wonderful service. We're all about loving Jesus in this church. So and I don't know you personally, but I want to get to know you personally. So thank you for coming. Thank you very much for coming. Isn't that right? We're all about loving Jesus. Anyway, my scripture, since, since Joel's not here, and I didn't know I was going to do this until the last three seconds. For God so loved the world, and y'all can help me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but yet through him the world might be saved. You know, our big thing is an outreach program, 4,500 unchurched homes within one mile of this church. So we're all about wanting to get those people in church. We're all about wanting to get those people to come to a saving knowledge of Christ. Got a few announcements. Uh, Jan's got a little piece of paper back there in the back. Matter of fact, that's a piece of paper. If you're interested, this is the book that Brother Toddy wants us to take on and read. He's, he's got a five or six part sermon series that he's going to do on those but of course he wants you to get the book read the book and understand the book before he ever gets into it i think i just read the book you know it's quicker <laughs> just being just being mean there financial committee if you uh last week joel mentioned that we had the new budget coming up the financial committee if you think you want to serve if you just get with jim sims on that uh again if this is a place you want to serve Tina's got a few shoebox announcements, and I'm holding her off till the very last one. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Why is she so happy about a shoebox? Do y'all know? Yeah. It's about, it's about Jesus. That's what it's really about. It's, it's not about an old shoebox. It's got an old dead shoe in it. It's all about the Word of God and Jesus reaching people. Uh, the, uh, 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 the Mallory's... Uh, uh, prayer week and the, and the whole uh, month ended at the start of this month so uh, uh, but and if you haven't given your contribution it's not too late you can still bring your contribution again this is this is home missions this is missions this is helping the children's home this is helping things that we really know is important uh, visitation again is not going to be this Sunday but next Sunday weather permitting we're going to be doing this throughout the end of the year if you would like and uh, uh, Miss Tina loads us up in a bus and she gets us to the top of a real steep hill and she lets us all out and we get to go visit people and walk down the hill. I don't know what you're going to do if you can't get to the top of the next hill, Tina. You're just going to have to work on that one. She told me, she said, do I have to back up all the way down this street? I don't like to back up buses all the way down. And I'm going, I'm sure God will work it out, Tina. Don't worry. I'm sure God will work it out. Choir practice. She called me this morning. I can't talk. I'm coughing, coughing, coughing. So we won't have the choir starting off. I know it was in the bulletin. It was going to be starting it, uh, this afternoon. So it's going to be canceled again. Pray for her. Pray for her. She's very sick. Our choir minister is very sick, and she needs your prayers. Her child had 101 temperature this morning. That's Jimmy. He loves her, and he knows her real personal. I think he's called her husband. So, he, he, you know, you can get with him and pray with him too. Uh, any other announcements other than Tina? Yes, ma'am. You want to come up here? Okay, come. You can come up. I got given a gift this morning, by the way. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It's not about Vacation Bible School, but if y'all want to pray for Vacation Bible School, y'all go right ahead, cause it's coming. Um. Next year. Yay, Vacation Bible School. Okay. Thank you, sweet Dalton. Yes. He's excited Vacation Bible School's coming next year. All right. So um, whenever we start having choir practice, 
um, when Miss Beth gets to feeling better, we are going to have children's choir practice, but it's not really choir practice because we don't really have enough children to have choir, so we're going to have joyful noise singers. So we are making that joyful noise to the Lord as the Bible commanded us to do, and because anything when we're praising the Lord, it is a joyful noise. And so if you have a youngin, they don't have to be here every week. I'll have CDs for them to listen to the music. They can listen to it at home. I'm easy. I'm not musically inclined. It's going to be a hot mess, but it's going to be a joyful noise to the Lord. So just pray for us on that one, okay? And it will be during choir practice because I'll have the kids over there anyway. So there you go. I'm so excited. Oh my goodness. It's October. It's time for us to go to work. But first, I'm going to make a calm announcement. If you deliver meals out of the freezer over there, on top of it is some insure. Um, it's a clear insure that was given to us. So please take your people, whoever you take it to, a uh, little, con you know, it's like four things to a Anyway, take it to them. Give it away. So, okay, I'm about to explode, y'all, and I'm going to save the best for last. But um, next week, well, let's start with Wednesday. Wednesday, we're going to get the long tables up here and move them downstairs so that we can put them all around the wall because next Sunday is two for two and bring somebody with you because we're going to let them work and serve God. We are going to move all of that shoebox stuff downstairs to the fellowship hall. And then after that, we get to come up here and organize it and get it all lined up for the packing party. So I cannot wait. So um, right now, our budget is kind of down. Um, we don't yet have enough stuff or money to make a thousand boxes. And I really do not ever want to go under a thousand boxes again if we can help it. So Y'all be sure, I didn't bring an envelope up here, but where it says other, you can write Roll Tide, War Eagle, Go Gator, Shoe Boxes. Cindy knows what all that means. So um, we just want to build a, a lot of shoe boxes because we have to remember that every shoe box given will have the Word of God in it. And every child who receives it will have the opportunity to receive Christ. And when those children receive Christ, I believe with all my heart, those parents, those neighbors, those communities, those villages will be reached. And that's, that's the most important thing we do. And we get to have fun while we do it. I mean, oh my gosh, it's so exciting. So now for my big announcement. Um, come here, Dalton. Yesterday we went to the pumpkin patch. Come here. And when I got to the, well, hold on, dude. Come this way. When I got to the pumpkin patch, before we even started, wait just a minute. Look, he's excited too. Before we even got there in the parking lot, he said, "Grandmama, guess what? Baby has, mommy has babies in her baby. That was babies, as in more than one. I'm getting twins. I'm done. <laughs> After all that, we get to open in prayer. May we pray. Gracious Father, I pray, dear Lord, that you'd bless our service today. You'd bless our pastor, Toddy, as he brings. May our hearts be open to his word. We welcome our visitors, Lord. We, we hope that everybody greets them in the love that you gave us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
You know, there's a lot of good songs in here. We were talking about one of them uh, in our Sunday school class that we used to sing years ago. A lot of young people may not remember it. It was called, In a Land Where We'll Never Grow Old. We're all planning on going there. You know, some of us don't want to be in a hurry, I don't suppose, but, you know, we have something to look forward to. The Bible talks about that hope that we have in Christ, you know, and um, he lives this morning whether we've seen him or not. The Bible said, blessed are those that have not seen and yet believed. And that includes you and I. We hadn't seen him like the disciples, like a lot of the Israelites did, but yet we believe, and we're blessed because of that. Yeah. The last thing he said is, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Let's turn number 220. 220. <clears throat> and I'll just sing a couple today, and we'll give you some more time to preach. Number 220, he lives. Let's stand on this first one, then I'll let you sit down on the second one, all right? <clears throat> Oh, wait. 
seated. All right, let's turn now uh, to another one about him being alive, and it's because he lived. Because he lived. That's why you're here today is because he lived. Number 213. <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's sing the first and the last. morning church so next Sunday is what is what's what's next Sunday the Lord's Day yeah that's always the right hand yeah a plus gold star for you next Sunday is second and two second and two second Sunday of every month we're talking about inviting your two they may not come they may ignore you, they may reject you, but we're asking you to, to bring or invite two peoples. We're talking about there's a lot of unchurched people that are living all around us, and we're just going to make an effort just to invite two people. And uh, this morning in our, in our small group, we had another testimony about this real short, read, real easy book that I asked to read. Who, who was it? Which, which, who was it that you, you want to say anything about it? What, what what you thought what you, what you were thinking about it or about the book
spoke to you? All right, thank you. Thank you for the music. Uh, this morning, I want to talk about something, a, uh, let, let's call it a plague. Let's call it a plague of, of this, this century and, uh, and, and this body of Christ. It, 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 it's something that I, at times in my life, have struggled with. It may be something that you're struggling with today. And I'm talking about worry and anxiety. Worry and anxiety. Two very uh, similar words, and anxiety is a more severe form of, of just worry. And uh, this morning, I want you to hear the greatest psychiatrist, psychologist that ever lived and his words about winning the war with worry. Now, before we really get started here, I want you just to take out a sheet of paper. You can take out your sermon's note, and I'm going to ask you to write down three things, three phrases that cause you to worry. Three things, three phrases that if you think back over the last week, you spend time worrying about. Uh, it could be your health. It could be your children, it could be your grandchildren, it could be uh, your, your, your bank account, it could be, you know, anything. But I want you to write down those three words or phrases, and I'm going to let the master teacher teach us about anxiety. I, I want to share with him something that worry and anxiety can be so consuming in our life if we're not caring and, and, and careful and I want you to hear what he has to say about overcoming worry and anxiety. You with me? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer first, shall we? Father, you know the things that occupy our mind. You know the things that have a tendency to, to take our focus and our mind off of you that can be so distracting and so consuming that it chokes off everything else in our life. Lord, help us to be peaceful in our, in our spirit, in our mind right now to hear you clearly and to obey you when it comes to overcoming and winning the war and the battles we have with worry and anxiety. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, worry and anxiety is epidemic in our country, and I want to kind of prove it to you. Matter of fact, let me just tell you, some time ago, the USA Today, the nation's newspaper, published a little survey, and they asked people, the, the, this particular survey did, they said, uh, what is it that keeps you from falling asleep at night? When you're trying to go to sleep, what is it that keeps you awake? And they listed the top five things about readers to their newspaper responded. The number five thing that kept people awake, according to this survey, was noise. Noise was number five. Number four was pain. They just were not comfortable. Number three, too much caffeine. Number two was room temperature. And the number one thing, according to this survey, that kept people from being able to go to sleep was worry, and anxiety. Now, in addition to that, the National Institute of Health, some time ago, I think this was back in 2014, so it's been a while, they said that in their estimation, uh, blank percent of U.S. citizens have an anxiety disorder, I mean a major diagnosis of anxiety disorder in their life in this country. According to the National Institute of Health, 31% of United States citizens in their survey could be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder in their time. Not only that, uh, I was talking to, uh, in my work, I was talking to a, a child psychologist, psychiatrist actually, and we were talking about anxiety, and the, the problem is today is that anxiety is, is happening much, much younger in children's life today than it was 20 or 25 years ago. You, know, you want to know why, according to her? She said it's because of, of social media and Facebook and Instagram because their whole life 
is out there on Facebook and their whole world is right there and it's, and it's 24-7. It doesn't stop. It's there all the time. And if somebody says something detrimental about them or the way they, work, the way they dress, then it's their world. And that is causing even our elementary and middle school students today to have much more higher chronic uh, episodes of anxiety than ever before. So it is epidemic in our society today, despite the fact that the United States of America is swimming in wealth, that we are a very wealthy country. So just because you and I are disciples of Jesus Christ doesn't mean that we're exempt from worry and anxiety, does it not? Doesn't mean that we're exempt from all that. So I want you to listen to uh, Jesus and his advice on overcoming worry and anxiety. Jesus was giving the Sermon on the Mount. Obviously, he, 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 you know, it was a very, very important sermon. I think Matthew took three chapters to talk about this. And he was talking about the dangers of laying up wealth and, and money and this, that, and the other. And then he's going to be, he's going to talk about worry. And I, I want you to see he's going to give us three specific pieces of counsel. If you're dealing with worry and anxiety, he's going to give us three specific points of advice for how you and we can overcome worry and anxiety. So I want you to turn. Did you bring your Bibles with you? You did? You did? You got it? You got your app or whatever you bring? Okay, very, very good. Gives the devil a headache when you bring your Bible to church and makes him nauseated when we actually learn from it. So today, we're going to learn what the master teacher his advice to help you and me on overcoming worry and anxiety. So turn over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start off in verse 24. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, Add a single hour to your life. Now, to be fair, if you look at the three things that people then were worried about, you see they're worried about food, water, and clothes. The things that we worry about, we worry about COVID, we worry about you know, uh, politics, we worry about crime, we worry about job security, we worry about our children, we worry about, you know, our 401k, cancer, all these things. The word worry comes from an old German word that means to, to choke or to strangle. And someone said that uh, worry, if left unchecked, is like a stream running through your mind that will cut a channel so deep and so wide that all other thoughts will be drained out. You know, it's interesting to me that in spite of the fact that our country is more wealthy than it's ever been before, the most wealthiest country in the world, that worry and anxiety are epidemic today. Still epidemic today. But Jesus says something pretty remarkable here. He says that we should not worry about anything. Anything. 
Anything. I mean, that's a, that's a tall order. I mean, we, li we live in a world of $3 a gallon gasoline, international terrorism, divorce rates, Social Security, a hostile political world. I mean, how, how do you do this? So what's the key to really not worrying and, be, and have a mind that's filled with worry and anxiety? Well, the first thing he says is, the first thing he says is, remember who your father is and that he cares for you. Remember who your father is and that he cares for you. You know where faith starts, worry ends. The two do not go together. And, and he's basically saying that your father cares for you and you belong to someone. That he has not left you an orphan. Uh, and he, he has the ability to care for you and you have a very, very good record of his ability to care for you. If you don't, look at the Old Testament, look at the New Testament, and look, and look at what it is. Now I'm going to say something else. Now, if you are seriously battling with worry and anxiety. And I don't know who, who that is, but I'm guessing that, that some people here are seriously bad. I'm going to ask you to, to do something. And I want you to start keeping a spiritual journal. I want you, if you're worried about it, I want you to start keeping a spiritual journal. Do you know why I'm asking you to do that? Because here's what you're going to see. I'm really worried about this. I'm really worried about that. And I'm really worried about this person in this situation. And write it down. And certainly pray about it. But what's going to happen is, as you go through time and you do this over time, you know what you're going to see? <laughs> I was really worried about that and that didn't amount to anything. And then you're going to be reading this, you know, a year, a year ago, a year, a year from now. But look at the past. Well, I was really worried about this person. That all worked out good. You're going to see this over and over and over again. That 95, 99% of the things that you're worried about, when you look back, well, that was silly. I really shouldn't have been worried about that. So if it's something that you're really worried about or you know someone that is really worried about that, keep a spiritual diary. So, and remember this, when we worry, you know what you're really doing. When we worry and we're filled with anxiety, we're really saying, I know what the promises say, but I really don't believe them. I really... I know what he says, but I really don't know that I can believe him. Worry is forgetting that the world and everything in it belongs to the Lord anyway. You know, someone, I heard this story, someone came up to John Wesley uh, 200 years ago. He's one of the founders of the United Methodist Church and went running up to him and said, John, John, your house has burned down. And he said, uh, no, it hasn't. It, it couldn't possibly. I don't even own a home. Everything I own belongs to the Lord. If, that's, if our house is burned down, there's one less thing I have to worry about. The biggest reason we start to lose battles with worry is because we choose, we choose not to believe the Lord. We choose not to believe the Word of God. We choose, we make a conscious decision to worry about it versus believe Him. You know, one of the titles of God is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. You remember where he got that title? When, when Abraham and Isaac went out went up to the mountain and he provided the, the, the sacrifice for him. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Jesus Christ. Food, water, and clothes. Now we're, we're so, that's so foreign to us that I'm, I, I'm worried I won't have enough water. I got to tell you this story. Uh, a couple of years ago, this pastor buddy of mine that I met 20 years ago in Kenya, he, he uh, and this guy is, was from Eldorot, Kenya. I mean, way, I mean, way back in the sticks. I mean, way, way back in small town Kenya out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, <clears throat> I've kept up with him over the years and him and his family. And he had never left Kenya, never been out of Kenya, and he came to the United States, and uh, I went and met him. I, I had to go meet him, and and uh, and I said, so, brother, I said, uh, <laughs> I said, tell me, you know, what's what's the biggest? You've never been out of Kenya. You've never been in the United States before. What? Tell me what the biggest surprise? What what really just shocked you? And he said, he said, I'll never forget what he said. He said, brother Jerry, he said, I'm staying in a hotel 
And he goes, there's probably 200 rooms in this hotel. I said, yeah. And he said, do you know in every single room in that hotel, there's running water? And he goes, there's water in, in their shower. And he goes, every, every room in the toilet, there's, there has water in every single room. I went, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, what it is, he doesn't have, his, his home, he doesn't have any running water. He has to go up on a, on a, up a hill and get a bucket and bring it down to his, his house. He, he doesn't have any running water. And they don't have any, you know, they don't have a lot of jobs. They don't have refrigeration. He doesn't have any electricity. So they have to really, literally depend on the Lord to provide food and water. Can you imagine that, I mean, you know, first of all, we have closets full of clothes. I mean, we have organized closets, you know, they hang out, they, well, I'm getting a closet company, and they're going to go organize so I can get more stuff in my closet, right? So, but these people may have had one outfit, but can you imagine, what if you were in a situation today where you had uh, four days worth of food and no way to get any food anywhere after that? I mean, these people back then, they might have not even known where their next meal was coming from, much less two or three days from then. And, and what, if, what, if, what if your source of water was a 300-year-old well and, and, and sometimes it ran dry and, and your, your source of water wasn't consistent and your source of food, you didn't know where you were going to get money or, or, or to barter or get food. But Jesus is saying, don't worry about that. Your heavenly Father knows, knows what you need but before you even ask. All right, so let's go back to verse 26. Now watch the master teacher. Watch this. Now imagine he's, he's, he's on a hilltop, he's teaching. Now watch what he does with this group of people in verse 26. I'm going to read you verse 26 through 30. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying at a single hour, to your life. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So I like to picture Jesus standing and pointing. Look at the birds. Look at the, look at the flowers that, that, that were very... So he, he uses an a, a example right in front of him. Uh, birds don't have complicated uh, refrigeration. They don't have food processing abilities. They don't have a plant to grow their, their food. They don't plant crop rows, but Jesus takes care of them. Now, let me be clear. Now, these little birds spend a lot of time and energy looking for their food, but the Lord provides it. I mean, the Lord provides enough food for them to feed themselves and, 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 their, and their little babies, and they are very disciplined about looking for their, for their uh, for their food, but I doubt very seriously in their mind they're going, oh my gosh, it hasn't rained in eight days. Oh, the ground is frozen today. How are we going to find any food? I just can't see birds in their mind worried about that. Maybe that's why they sing so beautiful. So the next time you hear a bird singing, just remember, that bird has a bird brain. I got the, I'm made in the image of Jesus. Amen. Don't be caught off guard and start thinking you're going to be worried all the time. With, if a little bird brain, little bird is not worried about it, and our master says you don't need to worry about it, then we don't need to worry about it. Amen. So Jesus takes care of their needs. We're more valuable than they are. We are, I don't know any bird that, that's an heir of Christ. I don't know any bird that, that's been filled with the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, uh, some time ago, my wife Cynthia calls me and she said, Jerry, the check engine light is on in my car. You know, the, you, yeah, uh huh, you know, you've gotten that call. Uh, it, it could be, you know, you think it, it, could, it could die any minute. 
the check engine light. Well, just know when we worry and we start to, where it gets to the point where we can't even fall asleep and you're worried, you're occupied all the time, just remember that's your check engine light on your little spiritual self right there. And, and when we start to worry, that's that little check engine light to check and say, have I relegated the Lord God to second or third place behind me while I'm focused on this particular very small problem? So the second reason that Jesus tells you and I not to worry, the second reason the master teacher tells you and I to worry is that it accomplishes absolutely nothing. It accomplishes absolutely nothing. Worry will not make you taller. It will not lengthen your life. And Jesus says, who can add a single hour? How long is an hour? 60 minutes. 60 minutes. Who of you by worrying can add even that long to your life span? Who? Nobody. Dr. Charles Mayo of the Mayo Clinic, let me give you this quote. He says, worry affects the circulation, the heart, the glands, the whole nervous system. I have never met a man that died of overwork, but I have known a lot of people who have died of worry. Worry can actually shorten your life. Let me give you this. Worry disrupts our productivity. Worry negatively affects the way we treat others around us, including those we love. Worry steals our best energy for today to pay a debt that we don't even know. Worry and anxiety steals our best energy and our creativity to pay interest on a debt we don't even know. Worry steals our productivity. If we are living a life that is filled with worry and anxiety. No matter what we say with our mouths, it proves in our mind we really don't trust the Lord. It is a mindset of tiny faith. You know, Jesus stressed a daily dependence on the Lord. Not a once a week dependence. Not a once a week, but a daily dependence on him. You know one example? He, when he taught us to pray, he said, Lord, give us our daily bread. He didn't say, you know, you, you go buy your bread for, for, oh, for, and keep it for the next two weeks. That's not what he said. And do you remember the Hebrews when they were in the desert, in the Exodus, and they gathered manna? And what, 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 what would happen if they said, well, I don't know. I'm kind of wor worried that this manna may disappear, so I'm going to try to get two or three days of manna. And what would happen to it? It would rot, right? So they stressed a daily dependence on the Lord. So I know a man that, that his country was occupied by a foreign military force. He was separated from those he loved. He was put in jail. He was stoned. He was beaten. He was on a ship that sank at sea. And after all this, he wrote to other Christians and said, be anxious for nothing. You know, it's a, it's, it's a sad fact. God gave you and me faith, but he intended us to use it. He did not intend to give us faith for us never to use it. We have to test it and try it out. You know, you can go to uh, Sunday school. You can go to uh, learn all about theology in Sunday school. You can all learn about all the dates and places. But we cannot learn personal lessons of faith unless we're out there living life uh, uh, and, and, and going through these things. And you know how the Lord, at least in, in my life, you know how he best teaches us about faith is when he whispers Promises of his word, confirms that, and then he steps back and allows darkness and difficulty and circumstances to seem to contradict everything he says. That's when we learn about faith. We cannot, it's, it's really, I won't say we cannot, but it's very, very hard to learn about real faith as long as we're comfortable, safe, 
and pleasant. So back in 28, Matthew, Matthew chapter, he says uh, in, in 28, Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. He says, I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow and thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, <clears throat> oh you of little faith. Now let me ask you this question. This, this is, this is going to be probably the, the most difficult question that I'm going to ask you today. Is your walk with the Lord, your Bible study time, in your prayer time, does it seem dry, parched? If it does, might it be because your mind is occupied with worry? Let me just say this, let me just say this again. During your study of the Word and during your prayer time, does it seem just dry, desolate, parched, where you don't feel that rich connection that you have with the Lord? Is it possible that your mind has gotten preoccupied with something else? I submit to you that it's highly likely that it has. In fact, uh, let me read you Matthew chapter 13, verse 22. You remember the parable of the sower? Matthew 13, 22, listen to what he said. The seed that fell among the thorns, the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, strangle it, Making it what? Unfruitful. You see that? The person who hears the word, the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke it. Is it possible that if you're spending time in the word, you're spending your prayer life, and, and it just doesn't seem as, as rich and wonderful and fulfilling and nourishing as it should be, is it possible that that check engine light came on you're worried about a lot of things that have just that's just sort of totally occupied your mind to the point where it's overshadowing everything else. Jesus says that worry will choke, will strangle your spiritual growth. Are you listening to me? And then and we start to we we start to live by sight. One counterweighs the other. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read you this. Turn over to John chapter 14. Now, now listen to Jesus, and I want you to see. Don't pay any attention to, to, the, to the breaks in verses in this, but just listen to what he says about where worry, when your heart's all troubled, this, that, and the other, and, and where, where, where that stops, faith starts, where faith starts. Now watch this. John chapter 14, verse 1. Do, this is Jesus talking. Do not let your hearts be you understand that's a command. So, so if you're worried and filled with anxiety all the time, you, you realize that you're disobeying the Lord. You realize that. Do not let your hearts be troubled, but what's, what's the next statement? You believe in God, believe also in me. You see the connection? Faith, worry. They don't go together. They don't live in the same house under the same roof. It's impossible to serve and be occupied with worry and anxiety all the time and then be a follower of Jesus and be, be loyal to Him all the time. It's very, very difficult to do. So Jesus is standing there. He's pointing at the flowers. He's pointing at the birds. And He's telling these people not to worry about anything. But He gives one last piece of advice right here and he says go I'm sorry go back to uh, go back to Matthew and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and start in uh, well let's go back let's let's start in uh, in verse 31 so do not worry 
This is Matthew chapter 6, verse 31. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink or what shall we wear? For pagans run after these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Here's his third piece of advice right here. Are you listening? But, all the worry and all the stuff like this, everything, blah, blah, yeah, yeah, watch this. But, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, or because, of, because I've said all this, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So, number one, seek first the kingdom of God. Now, what does that mean? Make sure the top priority in your life is serving the kingdom of God. Make sure that you're keeping the main thing, the main thing, the main goal. That's your objective, is to find, to serve, to advance the kingdom of God. Amen. Is that your main priority? Because if it's not, then that's probably one of the reasons why you're spending so much emotional time and energy during the day. That you're doing. You know, every one of us has the same amount of time in a day. All of us have 24 hours a day. And we only have so much mental and physical energy to spend during the day. And if we are spending that time, I, I know, you know, it may be something that seems really, your grandchildren, you love your grandchildren and you want them, and that may seem like a really good reason. But Jesus is saying here, are your grandchildren included under the category of anything? Yes, they are. And then he says, so, so make sure, seek the kingdom of God first, and then his righteousness. Now, what is righteousness? What is that? Uh, it, it simply means that you are in a right relationship with the Lord God. That you are, are uh, believing him. You've accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You believe what the gospel says. You're a follower of Jesus. You've given your life to him. You're in a good, right standing with God. And you know it. You've been born again. You have the, 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 the Holy Spirit of the living God living inside of you. You have His righteousness. You've accepted His sacrificial death to become right with that. Either you've accepted it or we've not. But if saving for retirement, if that's your number one priority and that's your number one thing in your mind, guess what your number one worry is going to be about? Yep. If your number one thing that, that you is your priority in your life is your children or your grandchildren, guess what the number one thing you're going to be worried about? If paying off debt and getting out of debt, if that's the number one thing you're going to be worried about, guess, what, guess, what, guess what's going to be occupying your mind? Getting out of debt. So now, I want you to, I want you to look back at the three things you wrote down. Look back at the three things that you spend your time worrying on. Is your mindset about those three things right? Are you following the commands and the teachings of your Lord about those three things? Yes or no? If you're not, then you know that's what you're going to be worried about. The bottom line is, what Jesus is saying, is that God can be trusted. Amen. The Word of God can be trusted. Amen. And part of it is, we accept the teachings of Jesus Christ, Amen. including this one. Now, sometimes for some people here, it might be a lot easier to invite your two for next Sunday than it is not to worry about something that's really pretty silly. Now, you can certainly pray about everything, but you don't need to be worried about anything. That's not what I'm telling you. That's what he's telling you. I'm just repeating what he says. And you know, the problem is, if we don't believe what he's saying and we're not relying on God, then you know who we're relying on? Me, my street savvy, my ability to manipulate and change and do all these other things. Worry steals your best energy that you have for living today. It 
chokes and strangles your and my faith, our journey with Jesus Christ. It's the opposite of what Jesus commanded. It will not add a single hour to your life. It demonstrates a lack of faith. It is disobeying Jesus Christ, and it proves that no matter what we say with our mouth and our heart of hearts, we really don't trust what it says. Jesus says, the answer is, remember who you belong to and that he values you, that he will supply all of your needs. Number two, worry does absolutely no good whatsoever. And number three, make sure you're seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. When you do that, your problems with worry and anxiety will go away and your prayer time and your study time and your walk with the Lord will become fruitful, lively, and fulfilling. Are you with me? If you're with me, say amen. Thank you, Lord God, for your word. Thank you that you've given us a formula to overcome worry and anxiety. We just have to believe. Lord, forgive us a people of little faith. It is so easy to put our trust in things and people and money and all the things that we have versus to walk by faith, to walk a straight line. But Lord, remind us that when that worry and anxiety is right in front of it, I mean, it could be a huge monster that you told us not to worry about anything, whether it's job situation, health situation, anything at all. Remind us of your words to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.